the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. They said we don't need no water, but we definitely don't want to let the district burn. This next debate that you're about to see will feature incumbent Councilwoman Erica Green as she takes on her definitely David and Goliath fiery challenge in Daryl Hurst. Now these two huh, would definitely give Trump and Biden's first debate a run for their money. As moderator, I didn't know if I had to change my church suit to get into a referee's outfit, but they talked about some, some topics that definitely face you, your children and your family and your neighborhoods. Let's join that debate already live in progress to see if on November 3rd, Erica Green will see four more years or will District 5 say it's time for a hurt side view? Good evening and thank you for joining us this evening for the District 5 debates for the seat of District 5 for Metro Council uh, here in East Baton Rouge Parish. So let's just go ahead and just dive right into it. So clearly you have challenged uh, Councilwoman Green. What is it that you feel that Councilwoman Green has not done her past four years to deserve another four years as Councilwoman? Well, I will never challenge her as what she hasn't done, but I will tell you what I can do. And so when I drive, I've said this several times because it's one of the things that just irks my nerves, is when I drive along Greenwell Springs and I see the Salvation Army and I see the same couches and the same mattresses and I go down Zion City and I see the same trash that has been out there and I go in Montesino and Delmar Village and I work with kids. And I'll tell you this, there was a study done a few years back where you, had, you put kids in a classroom that was completely torn apart. Okay, etched on desks, on to desk, etched on desks, um, trash all over the floor, and it was like the jungle in there. They took the same kids, the same classroom. They re they redid the classroom in terms of restoring it. Used primary colors, made a state of the art, and the kids sat down and they were way more attentive. They learned better. So I understand that something as simple as a crooked stop sign can deter a kid from being successful, or a red light that doesn't work in your neighborhood, or a flashing light. So what can blight do when you have houses that have burned down and have, and have been sitting out there t you know, eight, eight to ten months or trash has been out there for two and a half years? And so I know that there's a slow process with the, process with the city, but a year or two and a half years, that's beyond. It, it's either policy needs to change for the city or we're not holding the city accountable, but either one, it falls into the council's lap. No. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Councilwoman Green. What do you say to the voters as to why you need four more years as councilwoman? Well, I need four more years because I am committed to service and to empowering citizens as well as um, neighborhood associations. Um, I understand that there is concerns about the process for eliminating blight. But again, it's a process and um, we're all, every council member holds city parish accountable for blight. But for me, I have not only increased community services and resources in the district, um, and that's important when you talk about increasing services, because one of our community centers, the Charles R. Kelly Community Center, was lacking um, with services. So I put in, um, with a partnership with the Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank, a food pantry that's on site that addresses services. I, along with um, the Council on Aging, partnered um, to increase the services for our seniors in the district. Um, and when you think about increased services and resources on the community side, that's dealing with the budget because we only have a small budget for the community center. And so I can say there is something tangible that people can see, an active center where people can come in, any age can come in and receive services. Um, and I tripled the rentals there, which increased the budget because the budget for the center is small and it's not included in the District 5 budget, it's separate on itself. I had a capital campaign fund that started two years ago to actually raise money outside of just um, in, in, in outside of rentals. And so that's something that I believe it enhances quality of life. We have a community center that's vibrant. On the other side of that, I've done policy work, policy work with um, the local control of minimum wage. That's something that everybody is asking us in every debate, but I was the one that authored it. Also did um, decreased human trafficking with an ordinance with um, the hotel associations. And I also did 
um, uh, another ordinance dealing with the noise ordinance that was partnered with Southern Poverty Law Center. Those things are quality of life changes. And if you want to continue services and you want to continue policy implementation in the district, I, I'm the person that needs to be there. Right. Mr. Hirsch, you had a rebuttal? I do, because a couple of things that I want to address, because I've heard some of these things several times. And so you got to dive a little bit deeper. So one, I, I, I'm in youth sports. I, I service 1,500 to 3,500, 4,000 kids a year, depending on the year and what community events and attendance, right? And so when I put these events on in the community, I don't say what my budget is. I find community partners and I bring those partners in and I leverage their resources to make sure that we have impact. And so when we talk about the Charles R. Kelly Center, and I go there several times, my aunt is the staple over there. My wife's aunt, uh, Velma Maxwell, is a staple over there. It's closed down at most evenings. And there can be programming where you partner, you can be an incubator for small businesses through a CEA where you focus on the arts, where you focus on bringing in karate, where you focus on bringing in painting classes and pottery classes and giving an opportunity even for profit sharing through a CEA where it doesn't cost a center but it still adds additional revenues that are not a part of rentals or are not a part of whatever the center, center's budget is based on a uh, budget is based on partnerships that are in place. So, 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 so if I'm understanding, if the voters who are watching this are going to be understanding that you are somewhat not necessarily challenging, but questioning Councilwoman Green's efforts to be able to bring a diverse collaborative endeavor in order to expand these programs. Correct, and then also too, because well, I want to address a couple of things. We talk about Southern Poverty Law. Um, the guy that's over Southern Poverty Law, um, I've had the opportunity to sit down and talk with him as well. And when we talk about the noise ordinance, no doubt about it, there was bad policing going on and they were pulling people over, but it was mainly two cops. And those two cops were reassigned by Chief Murphy Paul and the situation was mitigated before the policy went into effect. So when we talk about relationships, which I've heard a lot about law enforcement and those types of relationships, that should have been a simple phone call saying, hey chief, this is happening in my area. These are the two cops. Don't waste time on policy. Let's focus on things, for, on, on policy for noise ordinances. Because when you talk about a bad cop, changing the noise ordinance, now it's gonna be a blinker. The next thing is gonna be improper lane usage. A bad cop is a bad cop. They don't, they don't need to be on the force. And, and better training needs to be put in place. Okay. And, 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 and we will get to policing later on in this debate, Mr. Hurst. Uh, Councilwoman Green, uh, what do you have to say in regards to uh, Mr. Hurst's uh, assumptions that you have failed to be able to try to bring those collaborative uh, stakeholders to the table in order to provide and expand services? So when I stated a capital campaign, I stated that because there's processes that you have to go through in order to receive funding for the city. And so a capital campaign allows us to have a fund allocated just for donations and resources. So we get donations from, from uh, businesses because that's a part of the businesses um, community. They're supposed to have a social responsibility to give back to the community and not just $250 and some chicken. I always say that I ask my business owners to give more. I ask my partners to give more. And I ask for the families that receive services to provide um, donations as well. So when you talk about collaborative efforts and fundraising for the community center, it is not about the budget, but you can't fund it without having additional resources. The other statement that I would like to address when um, he discussed about every policy um, you needed to do something with law enforcement. I have had law enforcement at my center, at my community meetings, as well as invited them myself to neighborhood association meetings. That's one side of the of the gamut on addressing community policing. I've also I'm also a member of Noble National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Officers. Even that organization requires policy to change justice. So um, you can't say policy with in, in, in um, elected position is not important because criminal justice reform, the actual term, means that you are implementing policy reform, implementing programming, and implementing um, grants and, and things like that. And so I've bought grant money to the Charles R. Kelly Community Center, oh, $70,000 for um, bicycle um, safety and education um, with Louisiana Highway and Safety Commission. And, and when you talk about evening programming at the center, 
you have to have committed people working at the, not the center, but you have to have committed partners. So it's not my job to have a, a to specify a nonprofit to work there. Every day we get people with awesome nonprofits wanting to come in and do over um, evening programming, but they're not sustainable. They come for two two evenings, and then we have people that work after hours that have to be paid, but the actual resources they cannot fund. So I like to partner with nonprofits, and I also have a discount for nonprofits at the community center. So when you speak on things, speak on the facts, and that's what I do. Yeah, so I would like to address it. I never said policy doesn't matter. What I said was in this case, a simple phone call solved solve the issue instead of months of policy that could have been used in other areas, which are some of the major keys in the district about blight, about um, strengthening the, 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 um, the um, impact of, of blight or these homeowners, these renters in these houses that uh, where, the, where the landlords are not uh, keeping those houses up and are creating turmoil in our community by, by, by having um, horrible structures. Is I, so I'm just saying those resources and time could have been allocated towards other policy. I didn't say policy is important. Number two, I never said that um, the community center, that a capital campaign fund is not important. What I said is through public-private partnerships, through a CEA and a profit sharing opportunity, no different than what Breck does with BRSC, no different than what they do with uh, the baseball leagues, taking those same exact models and bringing youth resources to the community where the kids may pay $5 or $10, whatever it may be, but now you have art classes, you have karate classes. It doesn't cost a small business owner anything because it's an incubator process where through that CEA there's profit sharing, but we create revenues because when those kids pay those smaller fees to come to the center, they're split between the business owner and the community center, and it is, it, it is, it is sustainable for that reason. Now, I've had a community tutoring program for over the last five years. My mother-in-law passed, it kind of faded off for a little bit, just so I can get my family back together. We, did a, we, we went to a different model. But I partnered with City Year, who was a sustainable, nonprofit, reputable person or group that has different volunteers on an annual basis and they focus on ELA and math. And so it's about finding quality partners. So telling me you can't find a quality partner doesn't mean that they don't exist. And that's why I talk about love is an action word. Love is an effort word. If you love the community, then your effort shows behind it. Do you have a bottle? I do. But, yeah, but what I'll say is we all have partners in the community. Um, the community center is but one outreach mechanism for myself. Um, I, I, I have a list of organizations that I'm in that I've served in leadership capacity and chaired numerous projects and programs across the city and specifically in District 5. Um, I believe that there's mentorship programs and tutoring options. Um, and, and I've done all of that um, with the help of other people, um, with the help of uh, community partners. And those programs have been more than, more than I believe sustainable in the community and, and geared towards certain groups. So mine was geared toward middle school young people. City Year volunteered at those as well. Um, the library system works with me on literacy programs. Breck hosts uh, work with work with me on the Black History Program, and that's just a few things. Awe Festival is an an opportunity for us to use Southern University to connect um, entrepreneurs and African American small business owners to um, the opportunity to expose them to more people. It, we do it in a fun way, in a festival, and people say nothing is happening in in the city. I've had on 500 people at the festival every year with many community partners. And so um, I think that every, every um, suggestion, every type of community programming are, are effective in the city um, and, and it's for certain, certain networks. I know that what I have done because I have so many community partners that support me. Um, I'm not listing names and organizations for the purposes of listing them. I'm sharing with you guys, the listeners, and the community, all of the efforts that I have done. 
it's a collaborative effort and I, and I support any any efforts in the community especially when it comes to young people I've been working with young people since I graduated from law school when I was at Prairie View when I was at Southern Law I have done public interest work in my practice I do pro bono services so my my specialty was at juvenile services and family law so I can't say that I don't have a passion for any of those things I think that passion combined with programming works, whether it's sports or not, but um, to insinuate that, that that work has not been done or attempted at or actually committed to, you have to think about unraveling some of the issues with the city. And when you start doing those things, sometimes you do get pushback from administration. Well, I will tell you why I will specifically speak on that, because I've been at China Bank Center for the last six years doing exactly what I'm telling her can't be done at the Charles R. Kelly Center with Elite Sports, my nonprofit. So for that reason, through a CEA, through an MOU, there are opportunities to expand, and I've seen other services in there as well. So I, I'm not talking about something that could be done or something that I, I'm, I'm thinking of or out of the sky. It's something that I've seen with my own eyes that District 5 is lacking. Thank you. So moving on to a big issue that faces the entire parish, especially uh, in um, minority-dominated districts uh, such as District 5. Um, on October 3rd, we hit 83 homicides uh, in the city of Baton Rouge. Um, and they're saying that if we continue this negative trend in regards to violent crime and homicides, that we could surpass the 2017 record of 106. If elected to District 5 or re-elected to District 5, what specific plans would you try to put in place to stop this negative trend of violent crime and try to work with the council members and the mayor president, whomever that may be, um, to, to stop homicides or, or at least decrease homicides, rather? Uh, Councilwoman? So my role as a council person um, allows me to use the, the interest that I have and the network that I have to work with decreasing crime, right? And so some of that includes addressing poverty, so uh, addressing and making sure that our workforce development programs are in place and reaching the numbers that they should be reaching. That was a problem uh, when I first got on council with Employee BR. And so I have done that, held them accountable to those, to those numbers and making sure they're doing outreach in the communities that they're supposed to be serving. Um, I also think that um, addressing our education system can help in my role, that means that I connect every resource that I have. If the city parish is going to do um, provide workforce programs for them in the summer, I'm going to make sure that the one high school I have in my district, Glen Oaks, has that opportunity. Um, if there is um, opportunities where uh, law enforcement can come in to talk to and do community policing in those schools as well that's in the district i will address that but you also got to move into the faith-based community um, and i have um worked with many of the youth programs in the faith-based community in our district and parish-wide to tr to try to give children exposure to new things when i when i used to be attorney in juvenile court it was exposure that was the issue, and I think we all agree on that. That exposure um, created um, for children uh, the lack of opportunity and then caused them to want to only address survival in their communities, which ultimately equal crime. Now, outside of children, there are uh, adults that are committing crimes, majority of these crimes, and some of them are domestic violence. We need to make sure there's programming and, and funding and, and I, I was on the founding members of the Butterfly Society, board members, and I still to this day provide financial support, provide help with um, actual uh, suggestions for that, for that organization, and help with uh, IRIS, um, Domestic Violence um, Center. Um, but also, the, the, the main part of crime is lack of fear, fear of nothing in this, in this city, in this district, and how can you provide fear in a community that doesn't believe that crime is an issue. You have to hold them accountable. And so on the side where I'm typically saying I defend criminals and I try to find ways and um, wrap, wrap around services for them, I also say that we know who's committing these crimes. We need to tell law enforcement. Community policing will help. Education support will help. Wraparound services will help, but we have to hold each other accountable. And some points that means telling auntie and uncle, if you know your, your child was out there the other day, you need to make sure that you 
tell them that they need to come in, they need to get a job, and we're not doing that in our community. My role is to connect them to resources to try to get them out of that situation. But the truth is, you can only address them directly. Thank you, Councilwoman. Mr. Hurst. So that kind of goes back to where I just said, we need programming after 5 p.m. to keep the kids occupied. I will tell you as a former athlete, uh, college athlete, high school, and youth, I used to hate going home every, uh, at six o'clock in the evenings. I hated going home. I wanted to be the person that went home at three o'clock, played with my friends outside, but it was a catch 22. They wanted to be where I was because the streets will take you over if you're going home unsupervised. It allow, what do they, what do they say, the, uh, an idle mind is the devil's workshop, right? And so that's why having that community center over, open after five o'clock is so important. That's why I drove from Gonzales to Scotlandville as many as five nights a week to work with kids who weren't my children all the time to ensure that there was something for them to do that kept that idle mind um, a, 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 away from things that could have turned bad. And when you talk about the Christmas crossover camp that I do every year at Southern. So I, I do, I, I'm a football, I'm a Southern football athlete, right? So my partnership is exposing the campus to make sure that kids have the opportunity to see HBU, HBCUs as a place where they can get a great education and move forward. And so my car was broken into. I was in Gonzales and I said, you know what? This is the crime rate here is supposed to be lower. I wonder what's happening in my neighborhood. It was right when the holidays hit. So the next year I said, Roman Banks, what are we going to do? At the time he was a basketball coach. So we partnered, we put on the Christmas crossover basketball camp. We brought in state police that talked about cyber crime, cyber bullying. Um, we did a campus tour using the recruitment department at Southern and Student Life, where we taught them about higher education outside of athletics, which is what they typically get the opportunity to see. And we kept them in a safe environment for two to three days, fed them the entire day, taught them skills and drills, and then had other additional motivational speakers come in. And we did that because we wanted to occupy them. So when you talk about little kids, you gotta keep them busy. When you talk about middle schoolers, you have to keep them busy. When you talk about high schoolers, you have to keep them busy. Now, how do we keep them busy? Because this, this is one of the main reasons that I'm running for office. How do we keep them busy when we have uneducated parents? I'm not saying all, just because you didn't get a college degree or high school degree, you won't make it. But statistically, I can tell you your success rate by the zip code you live in, which is uh, measured by the median income and the level of education in that community. And so if we don't work to re-educate our, 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 our constituents, 25 to 55, which are the parents of our kids, this is what happens. I didn't make it, so you're not gonna make it. And so you might as well quit school or quit sports and go get a job so you can help me pay these bills. I've seen it happen too many times, and a kid who was, I mean, could have touched the stars, went into a different direction. So, so, so let, 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 me, let me finish this one statement. Okay. So that's why creating an economic development plan that re-educates the 25 to 55, and I have a plan that'll do that. And by the time they finish with my plan, they will make 40 to 60 thousand dollars, have disposable income, but it ends with home ownership. And where in District Five? And that's one of the things that I want to ask today: is what specific policies has the current uh, councilwoman put in place that have directly brought resources, jobs, and other things to District Five outside of workforce development? outside of employer BR and things that have impact the, the parish directly. What things have been put in place specifically for District 5 that she's done that are not parish-wide services? Councilwoman. Sure. So District 5, um, let's start with Hollywood Street. Um, there is a new development coming on Hollywood Street um, that is a senior housing development. So we'll start there. Seniors are the ones that have the most that have the most uh, from the market studies that need the most housing, right? Um, and that's the goal is always home ownership. But um, what we did was when we when we um, worked with that uh, that our organization and developer to bring that um, to bring that um, housing development over there. I also asked him to also have a meeting with me and business owners, African American business owners at the community center. We brought in about 10 business owners. We promoted it um, on social media. We promoted individually, we sent out to our networks, and then we had a meeting with them. Many of those um, contractors and skilled laborers were hired to work at that, um, to work and to develop that uh, particular 
housing development. Also, um, there is another housing development or apartment complex that was uh, refunded uh, through CAFA. Um, and that particular uh, facility, when they came to me and said that they purchased it and they wanted to redevelop it, I asked them for a couple of things. I said I need a, a garden in that, in that apartment complex because that's quality of life. I asked them to add a laundry room in that area and they, they promised me that. And I asked them to make sure that it was affordable housing options in that particular development. They did all of that, right? Um, fast forward um, a year later, um, I'm campaigning and I go to that development and they're saying the people haven't did, um, haven't, our laundromat hasn't been open for six months. Okay. My role was, uh, my, my role was over with, with that, um, the actual development. But what I did was I called them back because that's a need in the community, called them back. And within two and a half weeks, their laundromat was back working. They sent me pictures. They constituents called me back and told me that was working. Um, and so there are different ways to reach the community. Yes, workforce development was one thing that I stressed because that's something that I believed in. When you're passionate about certain things, you push for certain things. And I saw the funding numbers. We're asking federal dollars to support this program. People trying to keep their jobs. Everybody loves working for the city, right? Um, but in essence, it's not a, a good program if it's not touching actual people. And so that's a, that's a way that I worked with the community to make sure that there was also employment opportunities, that there's also quality of life, and there's two different types. Now, I always want um, home ownership to be the number one thing in our district. And so that's something that I'm working with, um, working with Bill Baton Rouge on when they're acquiring properties. And I'm saying to them, as you're acquiring these 30 properties, what are you gonna do to put them back in commerce? Give you a prime example. Uh, a, a young man by the name of Laferito called my office and said, against all odds, wanted to work with um, and buy a particular property. Because it's acquired property, it's much less. He could have went through the sheriff's sale and all that, but he asked about that particular property. I paired him with Bill Baton Rouge, and guess what they're doing? He is getting a property so that they can rehab it themselves, empowering citizens to do things. So it's, it's, it's not about, I'm not posting it every day. Um, I should be. Um, but I'm not posting every day, but I'm working for the community. So, and I'll, I'll say those are project oriented jobs that may last three to five months. And I'm not taking away from any employment opportunity or whatever. But when we talk about long term sustainability in our community, it can't be a project oriented job. I know Inquest very well. Called them on the phone the other day at a con conversation about Level Homes and Waggers Pack. Know the family really well that owns Level Construction. So that's not, that, that's not a, a, a shot to say that, that we won't. But I, I, would, I would love to see, go over there during a the work week and see and, and ask everybody to raise their hand who lives in District 5. And, and, that, and, th and that's my challenge. And number two is sustainable jobs. Sustainable jobs over time is what raises the median income in our community, but not project-oriented jobs. Not taken away from it. May I address yeah. something? Yes, Councilor. Um, I host community job fairs at the district for whoever wants to have them. I post them on my social media pages for individual agencies, organizations, whomever that comes to me and say, because we're always saying, we want you to have jobs from our district. However, I, I have brought it to them, to individuals. I sent it to uh, neighborhood association presidents. I can't make every person go out for that particular job or make them, but engagement is an issue in the district. Engagement is gonna always be an issue in the district, but all you can do is continue to work. If five people come to community meeting today and seven people come to a neighborhood association meeting, I have nothing to do with a neighborhood association meeting, but I still engage them and I still support that association and I still work with them. I have set up Facebook pages, connected them to resources. I have also sat with them at churches, provided meeting spaces, but engagement and continuous engagement is those things that we, we have lack in in the African-American community. I'm not saying all over, but I have been to all of the neighborhood associations. And my job is to provide them the resources and the access. I cannot make you become, pick a, a particular thing. We have BRCC that does programming um, and, and PTAC can help you get TWIT cards. Again, everybody I know, I'm texting, I'm emailing, I'm trying to make sure they can get that access. But engagement is very different and it varies. Some seasons people want, uh, some seasons they're very, very engaged and then three to six months later, they aren't. 
And well, so my, my statement to that is, I'm going to keep working and using the platforms that I have to reach them. Well, so, I, 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 I want to well, say one thing, address that, Braylon. Okay, when well, you say, okay, when you well, say it's going to always, right? so, engagement is always going to be an issue, uh -huh. that means we're not thinking outside of the box. And those are the challenges that I have where I feel as a solution-oriented business owner, I can't go to my customer and say, your phone system is always going to be broken. Okay, I can't but find, what so, do you think that you would? But how do you think you would be more effective than the councilwoman who has uh, run? She she sat in the seat for a number of years. She's getting ready to run for re-election and claiming that she has worked in the district tirelessly day in and day out is finding problems with engagement. How do you therefore come with a different approach in order for it to be effective? Because as the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So so, so therefore, how how do you make those jobs? marketable how do you make those opportunities um i guess attractive to to individuals who would otherwise turn them down so so here's the deal i'm, I'm gonna hit two parts on that okay so the first part is the people from zion city called me and they said what's going to make you different the exact question you asked me and i said well what what, what do you want me to be different at right because the the district has different needs depending on where you live mm -hmm. a lot of times so they said mm -hmm. Well, what's going to make you different? And I said, well, I mean, again, tell me what your issue is, because we can, we can go around the horse with this, right? Like a merry-go-round. They said, well, our, our community is run down. Our ditches are, are not being properly managed. Um, it's been like this since, since I can remember. What will you do? And I said, you know what? I'm glad you asked that. I said, because that's one of my main priorities. I, I, I don't believe that we have economic ability to, econ uh, to invite e economic development if we're blighted and crime ridden. And so I contacted 25 businesses between Airline Highway and Hooper Road, Winfield Funeral Home, Board Lawn, Staples in the community. And I said, we've been investing in you for years. Will you invest in us? And they said, we'll give you whatever you need. I had dump trucks, skid steers, thousands of dollars worth of equipment because the city had not been responding to it and they had not done what they were supposed to do for months or even years, I contacted the community and they came and did it at no cost because they believed in North Baton Rouge and the transformation that I was trying to bring. Now, Mr. Hurst, 70 volunteers in the community, 200 tires, 20 tons of trash off of two streets. Right, but Mr. Hurst, though, and, and Councilwoman, you can also chime in on this too because it seems as though that Mr. Hurst is saying that if you are passionate and you can pick up the phone, you can get things done. Now, Mr. Hurst, is, am, am I reading that correctly as to where is that if you were the councilman, even if the city parish isn't going to fund it, you can't find the funding in your district, that you could be able to put those coalitions together simply by picking up the phone. So I, I, that's not exactly what I said because I had to go knock on some doors. I had to set up some meetings. I couldn't just settle for a phone call and people not showing up because they didn't answer or taking no over the phone. My AT&T business is number one in Louisiana, number two in the Southeast U.S. And when I worked for the company on several occasions, I was number one in the country because no was not an answer for me. No is we need to sit down and talk about it. And so I can't be on a, on a sales call and take no. My job is to turn no's into yes. And I've not only brought that in business, but I believe that that the council is the business of the city. It's managing a budget, no different than the business, and it's managing the resources, but also leveraging resources outside of your current environment to make your customer happy. And my customer is a constituent, and I was able to do that. All right, uh, Councilwoman. So um, the, the, the story that he told was about a, a certain community. Um, when I spoke with that community uh, on numerous occasions, prior to Mr. Hearst's involvement with and kudos was a great uh, cleanup day event. I have hosted at least three cleanup day events in Zion City. Before I was a council person with 1,500 volunteers, we not only touch churches, uh, we touch houses, we touch schools um, in that district. Before I was a council person, when I was a council person, I've done two community cleanup days since that. I've also done one in Montesano. I also done one in Park Forest, um, and so that's one way to engage communities. I'm not saying that they are not engaged. I am saying that there are different, like he said, different needs for different communities. And, and for that particular community, um, not only did I meet with them, we were planning a big event 
um, and, and it was going to have different aspects of it. And one of them was a community pride aspect. One of it was a uh, community cleanup aspect. And so many of those businesses had already been uh, reached out to. Um, and, and what I would end on saying is I already said that that was a good event and I support anybody. There are many constituents that come in the district to do community beautification projects. The city has a community beautification project um, and I bring in, I ask community stakeholders to be a part of it. I just had that conversation with a lady today. If you see that, what, how many people on your street is going to come and be a part of it? I'm going to come, but are you going to make sure that some people from your neighborhood come? Because the last time I did a community cleanup in, in Zion City, the issue for me was that there were more volunteers than actually community. So I was happy that he was able to engage the community, but to insinuate that these, these neighborhoods, I mean, and these businesses were not ever um, contacted is not true. Um, but it was a process for a, pro a long-term project. Um, and then the, the last thing I will say is that um, when you are considering ways to impact neighborhoods and citizens and empowering them, there are different needs across the parish, across the, the district. And what um, post-flood was needed in um, Monticello, Park Forest, um, Glen Oaks was very different was very different than the need to do community cleanup days, okay? It, it needed systematic, continuous resources for over two years. And guess what? I was the council person at the time, and not only providing good giveaways and food and distribution on things like that, I was tirelessly making sure that they had resources. My community center that claims to not be open, we were actually, the, the staff in there, including myself, was, in, was putting FEMA uh, applications in for elderly and, and individuals that couldn't do it themselves. So there is outreach that's happening. That's not the only role of the council, but th th those things are happening. Right. And so I'm not, anyway, I, I, I don't want to debate that topic. Right. I'm just saying that there, there is, and, I, and again, I believe that every association is different. And I, I'm happy that everybody finds different partners for different, different events and programs. I'm not knocking your, your effort, okay? But I'm saying that there, there, there's the story. I'm a lawyer. Everybody going to sell the facts the way they want to sell the facts. But I know the work that I've done. And I do have concerned. one more piece to it because you talk about thinking outside of the box. So while I plan on going in there and changing the policy so that we don't have to get outside people to do what the city's supposed to do, until that happens, I've contacted Sharon Mann at Republic Waste. We all I've, have. I've sat down. We all have. With, I've sat down with her <laughs> and I said, Sharon, does not, I said, Sharon Mann, in, in fact, I mean want that you're you, the only person that did that. I want you to help us create neighborhood associations. She said, why is that so important? I said, it's so important because when people in North Baton Rouge dial 311, they literally have tickets. So the same Zion City people she's talking about have a ticket open since 2018. There, there, there are grass tickets that have been over five months. So. I'm not saying that she's not doing a job, that, that she's not calling in and doing what she's supposed to do. I'm saying the city's not, resp not, 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 not responding. So I said, what we need to do is this. The only thing politicians care about is voters. That's it. They care about re-election. So I'm different, but the, I'm not, and I'm not saying she does, but the majority of them do. Because you see that the work is not being done. So they care about re-elections, titles, and positions. So let me, let, me, let me go somewhere with this. So when we create neighborhood associations, now we take back our neighborhoods. We organize our people. We create block captains. Not only is she doing that, but she's committed to pay for family days in the neighborhood so that we can put the community back in the neighborhood by bringing people out, getting information. And, and then the final piece of it is now creating a coalition of neighborhood presidents in North Baton Rouge so that they can go down to city council and say, look, you either do what we need you to do to help our community or we're going to hold you accountable and make sure you don't get reelected. So I'm putting the power back in the people's hands. Okay. And even so. Republic has to come to the council because they have the largest contract in the city and they too need to be held accountable. I agree with that, but, 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 but I agree with that. So going to our last two segments. So leading, uh, well recently, uh, when we saw the announcement of that Bayou Classic will now be going to Shreveport, um, I, of course, being in the hospitality and tourism industry and many of my colleagues who are my age, uh, very depressed because we're trying to figure out how in the world did Baton Rouge once again miss out on an opportunity I'm sad. Uh, to, to, you know, to bring yes. something uh, that's lively here to the community. Um, if elected or re-elected to the council, what will you personally do to try to be a friend of hospitality and tourism 
to start making Baton Rouge attractive to sporting events, to concerts, Ooh. to to things that could really revitalize and bring attention to this community. Councilwoman, we'll start with you. So I mentioned earlier that I did a, I've did done a festival the last four years called the Iowa Festival. It focuses on urban book and culture festival. Um, me, I wanted to stay with the books, right? But everyone around me said, and my board said we had to do more um, ex a, um, entertainment, right? And so um, I'm happy to say that I've partnered with the North Baton Rouge Hotels when I do the, when I do the festival every summer and I fly in authors and um, entertainers, um, I use the hotels over here because these hotels fund the North Baton Rouge Development District, right? right. Um, but what I found on the reverse of that, I found through that during those four years, the one thing that was very dis, uh, disheartening was that Visit Baton Rouge didn't understand how to market to our community. Um, and so when we sent out the release and the, the photographs, um, for promotion, they gave us um, a great, they, a, they were a great sponsor. The problem with it, they didn't know how to promote us um, and, and people of color. And so that was something that I told Paul Rigo, hey, you have to do a better job, whether that means you bring in somebody to address that issue. Um, and I think um, he understood. Um, they've made a significant um, movement. Um, Byron Washington is on my actual um, festival committee, um, and he's done the um, the, the um, uh, parade in North Baton Rouge um, during Mardi Gras. And so we have had these conversations back to back. We have held them accountable, not just visit Baton Rouge, but the city of Baton Rouge as well in marketing. So in order to um, enhance tourism, you have to make something effective that when I come here, I want to be a part of wherever that there are uh, communities of color doing, whether it's a, a nightclub, whether it's a festival, whether it's a football game. They didn't even know how to market Southern University. And that's Visit Baton Rouge who receives funding from our city. And so um, I think that I'm always supported. I'm gonna support the arts. I'm a ask the Arts Council and hold them accountable as I've been doing with ensuring that they are providing um, diverse entrepreneurs an opportunity to flourish, um, but uh, definitely want more uh, positive uh, programming in um, North Baton Rouge that focuses on the African American community. Southern University is a staple, um, and I'm one of those people that have been um, seasoned book holders since I was a baby, even though I went away to, to another HBCU, um, and I'm a seasoned book holder now, and I, I have to express that to them. Uh, and so that's why one way that I feel that I will continue to, to be a friend to the hospitality community and promoting your businesses um, in the process. Mr. Harris. So, so glad you asked that. So I'll tell you, I've worked with Visit Baton Rouge as well on events. We actually had something going on this year where we were bringing uh, about 150 teams here for youth sports. Let me tell you why that's so important. Because with kids comes what? Parents. And with parents, leverages hospitality. So I partnered uh, with Eric Raby on that. Um, he has a girl side, I have a boy side, and due to COVID, we backed it down. But I will tell you this, when Cortana Mall was on a decline, there's a place in front of Lowe's called, used to be called Silos. It was like a Best Buy before Best Buy existed or before Circuit City, right? And so it is a 50,000 square foot building that now hosts, that, that now hosts sorry, Louisiana fish fry products, the warehouse. And so I was working with Guaranteed Bank to purchase that property to put it back into commerce as a sports facility so that I can attract people to the north side of Florida Boulevard. It's industrial. It's a perfect corridor. Then Brett came in and said, hey, don't do that. We want to create a partnership with you. We don't want you to compete with us. Let me give you basketball and then we'll create volleyball. Carolyn McKnight left. Corey Smith gave it back to me again. Then he said, I got to pump the brakes because we want to make sure internally we're in a position to bring on new partners, and at the time, we're not. Now, I'm going somewhere with that because I just had a recent conversation uh, with Bernhard Capital about the old Belmont Victoria that's right across the street by kind of next door to High Neighbor, that grassy area. It used to be a major convention center um, as well as a hotel. It is a perfect place to bring a sports and art structure in North Baton Rouge. And so through our partnerships, we plan on making that happen or at least exploring those opportunities. In addition to that, in District 5, I've talked with Exxon 
about making that green space a park, the, 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 the buffer zone, because it's so blighted. How do we fix that, right? So we talked about bringing parks there. Why are the parks so important? When you create something large with dog parks, which we don't have in North Baton Rouge, by the way, except till you get the Baker, which is considered part of North Baton Rouge, but I mean in the city of Baton Rouge, there are no dog parks. Black people have dogs too, lots of dogs. So about turning that green space into a usable space. Now you talk about family reunions and other things in North Baton Rouge, in this area that drive people from right there on Scenic Highway, it also beautifies it, right? And, and drives them to the hotels in the area. So I am a big proponent of sports, recreation, and also building families, which is why I'm working with Exxon and having those discussions about how can we use that green space to deter blight, put up crime cameras, and create activity so that it doesn't continue to be an eyesore in our community. Yes, and so the last segment, of course, we want to touch on is racial unity. Four years ago, um, it was said that it was going to be the hottest summer in Baton Rouge, and it wasn't because of the heat. Um, we were on a racial powder keg waiting to explode, of course, with the shooting of Alton Sterling, and then, of course, the police officers, and, of course, we were dealing with the flood. Uh, my question is, if elected or re-elected uh, to the city council, what will you do or try to implement so that we can continue to bring this city together? So I'm in a breakfast club. Ironically, it started after um, Floyd, uh, Mr. Floyd's death. Should have started after Alton Sterling. But the Breakfast Club is a group of business owners, and it's very small, about six um, uh, white people and six black people, different um, backgrounds. And it came from actually two fathers who were um, at a baseball game and just were talking, like, how do you feel about all of this racial tension? Um, and so what we meet once a month and the discussions that we have are about um, race, right? If you can't say black and can't say white, then you already have a problem in addressing racial issues. Um, and so it's, it's a group of people that I have never met, and I've been in the Forum 35, I've been in uh, Junior League before, I've been in all these groups, but they always touch on it, but they don't ever hit the, the, di the dynamic. So what um, we have committed to doing, and I think it was a good, it's a good um, start for um, addressing um, racial um, disparities, is that we're, we're bringing each other into our um, areas. So I'm bringing them to North Baton Rouge to see North Baton Rouge. Um, and for example, when, I had, when we did our middle school program at the center, um, we allowed the kids to ride the bus. Uh, and when we got on the, the bus on Plank Road, uh, the teacher said, I have never rode on Plank Road. I've been married to someone from Baton Rouge for four years, never rode on Plank Road. And so that's something that we always hear when we get into these conversations in rooms with our colleagues. And so that's something that I always try to uh, find different ways to bring them to, to the district, to the community. Um, that's not a plan. That's just, you know, that's just more being human, you know. And so we need to have more human interactions. Um, and, and that's the only way I think that my council members, other business owners, and um, in the community that will understand how to address racial issues because they get to come see it. They're never going to be able to walk a, a day in our foot, uh, in our shoes, and to understand the, the things that we go through. But I think that that's a start. Um, and it's a, a very lighthearted way to address it, but I just want to say that because that's something I'm, you know, a lived experience that I'm going through right now. Mr. Hurst? So I will tell you, that's why I love sports so much. I love it, love it, love it. If I could say it three more times, that'd be fine. Because sports is the great area that merges everybody. When you think about youth sports, when you think about high school sports. So what I, that's why when we talked about creating that facility, when you have a facility that's thriving, that looks great, that is on a main corridor that's inviting, it makes people come across town from the other side of Florida Boulevard to be a part of that. That was the intent behind it. So we have to continuously create resources in the community that attract people from the other side of Florida. And I'll tell you, I focus on kids because a lot of adults, while dialogue on race is important and I think it will change, people have to be willing to commit to that conversation. And a lot of people aren't. But focusing on the youth so that when they grow up, they say, hey, that's not a black poor kid from North Baton Rouge 
well, that's not a privileged white kid from South Baton Rouge, but that was my teammate, my future classmate in college, a future business leader, because I saw him as the individual and not the part of town that he was from, okay? And so when we talk about that, those are the things that merge. And I'll tell you, when I had the Breck plan and I presented it and they approved it, it was about making the kids from Highland Road play at Anna Jordan and creating neighborhoods. I believe in neighborhood schools now. I, believe, I love the old school public neighborhood schools. And it was about creating neighborhood teams. We had the, the Highland Road, which is now Liberty, was the Lehigh Rebels. We were going to have the Anna T. Jordan kids as the Scotlandville Hornets and create the, 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 the Maplewood Park kids as the Glen Oaks Panthers. And now Glen Oaks has to go down to Highland. Highland has to come up to Scotland, Scotlandville. And now they are playing in each other's territories. They get to see different walks of life. And we start letting them know that you don't have to be scared. Tony's and Krispy Kreme are not the only two things that happen here. But in addition to that, my plan to create merchant associations and model what they've done downtown. Oh, let me tell you something. This, we talk race. We do. The white folks are scared to drive from LSU to downtown through South Baton Rouge. So they cleaned it up. Okay, they cleaned it up. No, that's the bottom and the top. We, as black folks, we, growing the better is what we called it. So why couldn't we do the same thing here? So I've gone to Lafayette and met with the COO for Affordable Home Furnishings. I've worked with Mr. Frank Brown because we talked about leveraging resources. And so when we clean up our community, I was paying 150 to get my yard cut. Now I'm paying 50 because instead of cutting one yard, he gets 40 yards. So now it's pooling resources. Now we can get street sweepers. Now we can't have full-time security um, because a $400 a, a day business can't afford $400 in security, but if I pull my resources, now the security uh, the, or the police officer can monitor my block with my 30 to 40 blizzards on my couple blocks. So it's about thinking outside of the box. And that's why I tell you, I have nothing against Councilwoman Green by any means, but I just don't take no for an answer in my business. I won't take no in the answer from city government. I, w I won't take no as an answer from DPW, and I won't take no as an answer from the businesses in my community where we can work together to beautify it and make it a place that feels safe for anybody to come. Because a grocery store is not coming to North Baton Rouge if white folks won't cross the Florida Boulevard line to go, to go uh, spend money there. They won't do it. Not, not the ones that we're looking for. We have to put them in a position where they feel comfortable and inviting. And that's why seeing blight out there for two and a half years disturbs me. Because until we have economic development, raise the median income, that is the number one solution for crime. And I know we didn't get there, but that is the number one solution for crime. People on Blue Bonnet are not committing that many murders because they can go to the mall and buy the tennis shoes that they want. They can go to the grocery store and buy the food that they want. Our people in our community are committing crimes, the majority of them because they lack the necessities that they need to feed their kids, to put roofs over their head, and to have pride in their household. And through economic development, merchant associations, bringing activities in North Baton Rouge that invites the other side of Florida, we can close that gap. You have to think outside of the box, Braylon. And with that, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. You all will have 30 seconds for your closing statements. I'll start with you, Mr. Hurst and Councilwoman. You'll have the final word. I'm excited to run. No after November 3rd, I am confident that I will be representing District 5 and we will have the change we need. You guys have heard today the difference in the two. I have nothing against Councilwoman Green. As a matter of fact, I sat with her and told her that if I, lose, if I lost, I would be in the office the next day putting a plan together because I'm doing this from my heart. I've been in the community for eight years when I didn't live in the district, right? I was traveling here every night to North Baton Rouge. But what I will tell you is this, if you want somebody that thinks outside of the box, if you want somebody that doesn't take no for an answer, if you want somebody, I say it this way, if you are comfortable with the last five years, then I'm not the person you need to vote for. Because if you want the last five years for the next eight years, I don't wanna be a part of it. But if you want change, if you want economic growth, if you want, the effort, the love word is effort. If you want continuous effort and no giving up, then I'm the guy you need to vote for. On November 3rd, 108 on your ballot, vote Daryl Hurst, keeping families first. Councilman. Um, I'm a daughter of District 5 of the Baton Rouge community. I've worked with the NAACP, I've worked with um, churches, and I've actually not only committed to doing work and committed to proposals, but I've actually fostered the relationships that I have with business owners. You have to understand that I want sustainable uh, business support as well. I want them to have a social responsibility mechanism where they are being donors in the community and invest in the community. 
and I'm, I would want them to also be able to employ people in the district as well and grow the district. Um, to uh, Also to understand that the type of leader that I am is not one that takes no for, for example. When I came in the seat, I had a vision. I sat with my staff at my center, told them the vision. I sat with my staff in my office, told them the vision. I met with my associations um, and I supported them in what the projects that they wanted to do. There are alternatives to programming outside of the community center and in the actual district. There are alternatives into empowering a school systems. And I've done that, whether that's a mentorship program, maybe whether that's harping on this, the mayor's office to provide resources and to connect with all of our schools in the area, or bringing churches who say, I want to be a part of things, and connect them with the departments that can help them do that. And departments don't just mean public, public works. That's a lot of agencies and city parish that provide resources, provide funding, and support. We, we received a grant for in um, District 5 for roof reset. And that was not because they, they knew about the project, that's because I brought that to the, to the citizens. Um, and that's just one type of thing that I brought to the district. Um, I am an inclusionary leader, which means that I realize my demographics of my district that used to be black and Vietnamese is now black and Hispanic. And I made sure that they felt important. And I talked to those kids at Glen Oaks. I sent them, funded them to go to um, um, a conference to help empower their voices and advocacy. And I also provided them with support in, in, in leadership and provided their parents with support. And so when you're thinking about the, the city and the nation as a whole, there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed. I'm not taking no for an example, for an answer. What I am doing is being strategic in leadership and I'm a visionary. And so when that happens, you have to find different ways to fund. You have to find different ways to provide services. And I'm doing that. I have a great relationship with my community where there are faults. I try to address them and I will continue to support them. If you want to have continued resources and service and expand funding in the district and expand networks in the district, including working with all the agencies and hold them accountable, even the city parish. And sometimes I don't agree with the mayor either. And that means holding her accountable. Even when you bring services, you have to get reports from them. So all these agencies and businesses that we're naming, they come right before the council because of the agenda item that council members put on the agenda. So we are holding them accountable. I'm holding them accountable. I like to continue service and complete the work that I've done. If you want to stay with me, um, vote Erica Green, District 5, number 107 on the ballot. Thank you. Well, thank you all and we wish you both well on November 3rd. Thank, thank you, so you so much, Brandon. Thank right. you.